All right, Nuggets fans, welcome into Pickaxe and Roll, brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. I am your host, Ryan Blackburn, at NBA Blackburn on Twitter, part of the Mile High Sports Podcast Network. And I am very excited to talk about last night's Denver Nuggets win as the Denver Nuggets defeat the San Antonio Spurs final score 110 to 105. Really great stuff from your Denver Nuggets as that could have been a, a bad loss. That could have been really bad. Uh, fortunately for Denver and fortunately for uh, just everybody involved and for Nuggets fans. Don't have to think about that. The Nuggets have taken care of business against just about every sub 500 team they have seen. And it's been good to see Denver kind of do that because they would not be in a position to get the one seed if not for that. Uh, they have solidified things really, really nicely. And it is nice, I think, for Nuggets fans to realize, hey, this is this is actually a thing. This could be a thing that Denver actually gets. Uh, but more than that, last night was a lot of fun because Jokic and Wemby are fun. Because Nikola Jokic and Victor Wembanyama doing the things that all Nuggets fans are hoping that they do. Uh, the energy in the building last night was poor for a while. It was not good. There were some oohs and ahs, ab absolutely, for different things that Jokic did, for different things that Wemby did. But it wasn't until Denver really locked in and, and started giving Nuggets fans something to really cheer for that things actually changed and that Nuggets fans could really get into the game fully. So was nice to see. If you can, it would be awesome if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast, like, and subscribe to the YouTube video below. That would help out tremendously. Hope everybody in the comments is having a good day. I uh, see Dr. Van Nostrand has been in here. I see Martin Hodel has been in here. Going to be really good. Um, Rob Sheldon. I'm pretty sure now that Houston is over 500 again. The Nuggets have one loss to a sub-500 team, Utah in Utah. You are absolutely right. That is exactly what I was thinking about when discussing this thing. Uh, if you go to the expanded standings over at ESPN.com, you can absolutely see that the Denver Nuggets are 25-1 and one versus sub-500 teams. Uh, that is a pretty, pretty impressive number. And Nuggets fans should feel really good about that. Uh, Denver has taken care of business in a lot of ways that they haven't in the past. I, I think if you've been a Nuggets fan for a while and you remember the 2019-20 season when Denver went to the Western Conference Finals, it was right before COVID hit during that regular season. That year, Denver lost so many games, <laughs> so many games to bad teams, like legitimately horrible teams. I remember Golden State coming in without Draymond Green, without Steph Curry, without Klay Thompson. Obviously, Kevin Durant had gone. They didn't have anybody. Eric Pascal of, uh, I think, Villanova just killed Denver, and a, no a number of other guys killed them as well. And they like absolutely let that one slip, but they didn't do it tonight or last night, excuse me. They haven't done it that much over the course of these past couple of years, if we're being honest. And 26 and one or 25 and one, I think it was the number. 25 and one against sub 500 teams is an incredible stat and does deserve a lot of credit for Denver taking care of business. And it's one of the reasons why I have confidence in them because they know when they have to lock in, they haven't let go of the rope. Sometimes against the better teams, they'll lose, but you could say the same thing about any team. So been really impressed with it. Let's talk about Jokic and Wemby. Um, we are also going to talk, and, and Martin brings it up here. I'm not even going to save it for segment two. We're, we're going to talk about it in segment one. Denver's transition defense. Got a lot of, a lot of breakaway layups, especially during the second and third quarters. Uh, Denver's actual level of commitment in this one was probably not what it needed to be. And yet they still managed to win because I think the Nuggets have mastered the ability as hey, 25, 26 and one against sub 500 teams. I think they have mastered the ability to give the exact right amount of effort. I really do. And it helps when Nikola Jokic 
goes for 42 points and 16 rebounds and six assists and does everything that he does. Uh, but for Denver, I think that the right amount of commitment to transition defense and uh, like defensive rebounding and things like that, the defensive rebounding was bad too. Uh, but the right amount of commitment there is just enough to get the job done in these situations because the Nuggets are in this home stretch where they've only got six games left to go. They've got another four on the road. They are going to kind of struggle to get through the finish line, but and it's going to be pretty tough. But I do think that at this stage, the Nuggets have mostly done a good job of righting the ship after those two losses to Phoenix and Minnesota. Uh, the big win over Cleveland, obviously a, a big time win, but this one against the Spurs, which was a sneaky opportunity for them to lose, they could have they could have certainly dropped it and they didn't. Victor Wembanyama is a lot of fun to watch, man. Victor Wembanyama is a very, very impressive, impressive rookie, and I've had the opportunity to see him twice in person now. The Nuggets could potentially play him again in I think the second to last game of the season, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me just check Denver's schedule because I know that they play San Antonio and Memphis in the final two road games of the year. It is San Antonio and then Memphis, so second to last game of the season. I wonder if Wemby gets shut down by then. I wonder if they decide, you know what, you've done all you need to do. But we'll see. We'll we'll see what actually happens with it. Wemby's obviously very competitive, and it wouldn't surprise me if the Nuggets drop that game in San Antonio because They've played San Antonio three times. Jokic has been great in all three of them. But at that point, it just would not surprise me if Denver was like, you know what? We're good. We don't we don't need to do it. But I will say, I asked Joker like if it's his goal like to play every game. Like, and, and he said it is for the entire rest of the regular season. Now, if there's something that impacts him physically, then he may not. But I wouldn't, I would expect the Nuggets and Wemby to sort of face off once again. I'd, I'd expect Jokic and Wemby to face off once again, as long as everybody's healthy. Because, and you're going to want that as a Nuggets fan, because this was a lot of fun to watch. Like, Wemby's incredible. Nine blocks, eight assists. I think he had 23 points and 15 rebounds. Now, what I will say is this. Did take 29 shots, shot nine of 29 from the field, and only two, like two of 11 from three. So that means he was actually seven of... So math is hard. Seven of 18 from two. Uh, not great. Not not a great offensive game from Wemby, to be clear. I thought other guys were better. Malachi Branham did a pretty good job for them. Uh, Trey Jones did a pretty good job for them. He had 11 assists and just uh, and actually zero turnovers. <laughs> Trey Jones, a plus 13 in a game that the Spurs lost by five. But it is impressive to see what he can do, Wemby, just from an all-encompassing standpoint. And when he and Jokic go back and forth, it's a lot of fun because they are so different and yet so singularly unique that you can draw similarities to that actual skill set and trying to build around such a unique skill set too. Michael Malone called Wemby the future of the NBA last night uh, as, as much of credit as Malone's ever going to give to another player. And I wonder if uh, Malone wouldn't have given that credit if he thought that, okay, that's actually going to, it's going to butter up a contender or some other player that feels like he's giving confidence to them over his team. But fortunately Malone can be very gracious in a win and the Nuggets can be very gracious in a win. And Aaron Gordon used six reallys when saying that Aaron, or that Victor Wembanyama is going to be really, 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 really good. Uh, and then Jokic obviously had very complimentary things to say last night, and they were going back and forth in the in the post game presser, and just a lot of fun to sort of see this unfold. I really do think that this matchup between those two, as Jokic goes for his crazy numbers and dominates consistently, Wemby goes for his numbers, and even like takes it back to Jokic at various points. The Nuggets had to switch the the matchups in the second half. They had Aaron Gordon guard Wemby at that point. And it was interesting to sort of see this unfold where they were guarding each other at the beginning. 
And then the Nuggets were like, okay, now it's it's time to win. Let's put Aaron Gordon on Wembenyama. I honestly think that that was done to, for two reasons. One was to save Gordon the physical burden of having to guard Wemby for the entire game. And two was to actually keep Jokic warm and to challenge him a little bit defensively and say, okay, hey, this guy's really tough. Go guard him. And I thought that Jokic did an okay job. It, it wasn't perfect, but... From an offensive standpoint, Wemby wasn't amazing. I will say that the assists that he had, a lot of that was because Jokic was a little bit slow in space, sort of recovering back to Wemby and, and doing a good job of getting hands and passing lanes, things like that. Jokic only had one steal. I think that he, if, he, if he was a little bit quicker, if he was a little bit more engaged on the defensive end, and he, and he was for the most part, but if Jokic was a little bit more engaged on the defensive end, he probably could have had two, three, four steals. But it was still really impressive to watch Wemby go to work, to watch what he could do, impacting the game on the defensive end. And I made this point last night in the pressers and in my article, uh, if you're interested, read it at milehighsports.com. I made this point that Wemby's shot blocking, as great as it was, it may have helped Denver get the win because on the final Michael Porter Jr. three, Christian Brown had six assists. He hadn't had a lot of points. He has an opportunity after Jokic kind of sets him up going towards the rim in mid tran like really just transition. Wemby was lurking, though. Christian could have challenged him at the rim late in the game. Would have been a very confident drive, but might not have worked out because Wemby had already had nine blocks at that point. And if he had had 10 at that point, a triple-double with blocks and just one assist off of the quadruple double, then that would have been incredible as well. But instead, Christian kind of dribbles it under the rim and doesn't go up like uh, Earl Boykins back in the day or just some of these other point guards like a Chris Paul or Steve Nash or these other guys that have made a habit of using the baseline underneath the basket to help create some other angles to be able to shoot and to be able to score, to be able to pass. And he found one for Michael Porter at the, not the top of the key, but above the break on the right wing. And Porter, who had really struggled throughout most of the game as a shooter, lines up and hits a clutch, clutch three to win the game effectively for Denver. Uh, game went from tied at 105 to 108 to 105. And then Denver, I think, hit two free throws after that, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was Jokic who hit two free throws in the clutch after the Spurs went down and missed a three themselves. So just a really, really impressive game from a, a variety of guys. But Christian Brown found a way to impact things with seven assists in 27 minutes. He's been playing the backup point guard spot for Denver. Reggie Jackson, I thought, was pretty bad. Nine points, four of 13 from the field. He was plus eight, had the third highest plus minus. But for the most part, I think that was due to like, just the lineups that he was playing with. The beginning of the fourth quarter lineup was pretty good. That had Reggie, uh, I want to say Justin Holiday, Michael Porter, Peyton Watson, and Aaron Gordon. That group I thought was pretty good. And there were a variety of ways that you could sort of look at that. Aaron Gordon finally like, kind of slid over to backup center, did a nice job. He led the team in plus minus at 23 points on nine of 12, seven rebounds, four assists, two stocks, had a hard fall last night, but he was okay. Had a couple made threes, uh, just did a really nice job. I thought uh, Spurs didn't really have an answer for him, especially when Wemby was on Jokic, because if, if Wemby was on Gordon for that entire time, I wonder if Gordon would have been as involved. But he still hit a couple threes. He had an opportunity pretty late in the game to take another left corner three, just wide open. Uh, Wemby was conceding the shot and looked at him for three straight seconds. And then Gordon decided to pass it up and got it to Jokic. And Jokic made a clutch uh, jump hook over the top of Wemby at that point. But Really, really important for Denver to get this win. I thought that they had a nice, like, this was a really good, impressive win because it, like, you can always lose these. 
you can always, always lose these particular games. And I am excited to see that Denver has like, they're, they're still pretty locked in at this stage. It could have been worse. Denver lost this exact game last year. And I think that would have been like the equivalent of nuggets versus rockets. No, that was, that was later in the, that was slightly later when the nuggets went and faced the Spurs in San Antonio last year, that actually lost Jokic his MVP because Samu uh, Sandro Mamu Kelashvili uh, hit some crazy threes and had like 19 points and went five of six from three. And despite the fact that Jokic did a great job, like he was shooting and hitting over Jokic from the perimeter. And I thought that we were going to get a repeat of it at, at one point. Uh, Sandro was, was hitting some shots and had 10 points in this one. Uh, but like he was, he had a plus minus of zero. Uh, despite the fact that the rest of the bench was basically negative for the Spurs. So, look, Denver could have dropped this one. And the fact that they didn't gives me a lot of confidence in them. They have been locked in. They haven't had to give a ton of effort. And this last one I don't think was a, a super high effort game. Like, they just had to execute pretty well. And if they had shot the ball better, then they would have been, like, they would have won this going away. But good to see Denver get it done. Good to see them figure it out if they hadn't. That would have been way worse. Let's take a break. When we come back, we are going to talk about the MVP straw poll and everything that comes with it. Going to be very, very interesting to see whether Nikola Jokic gets his third MVP. I think we're we are well on our way to watching that. But first, everybody, we're changing the game. Win some money this season with Superbook Sports, the most trusted name in sports gambling with a direct line to Las Vegas. And now you can use their promo code Mile High and score up to 250 bucks with their first bet bonus. Win or lose, Superbook will match your first bet up to 250 with promo code Mile High. Down the Superbook Sports app, enter the promo code, and you'll get 250 bucks, courtesy of Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem call 1 800 Gambler. We'll be right back on Pickaxe and Roll. All right, we're back. Pickaxe and roll. Ryan Blackburn here. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into the show. Really appreciate all the love and support on the podcast. As always, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast or hit the like button and subscribe button on the YouTube channel if you are listening on YouTube. Always appreciate the live audience. And I know I go live at, at some interesting and unique times, I'll say, but it was still nice to see some folks hanging out in the chat. Really appreciate it. All right, let's go over this MVP straw poll. I am going to try to share my screen here. Going to uh, yeah, let's let's see if I could share this tab. Okay, this is the MVP straw poll that ESPN and then ESPN's Tim Bontemps has put out there. I'm going to try to make this a little bigger. All right, every year. Tim Bontemps of ESPN has put out these straw polls throughout the season, trying to get a gauge on who a MVP award. And we've seen this impact everything. And we've seen this impact uh, nothing at various points. But last year, this one, when the final straw poll, like, like two thirds of the way, three quarters of the way through came out and Jokic was leading Embiid. There was a big uproar. Everybody was like, what the hell is going on? This year, Jokic's lead is pretty strong. 85 first place votes is a lot. <laughs> Shea Gilgis Alexander collects 10 first place votes. Luka Doncic has one. Giannis has two. Jason Tatum has two. I'm surprised that Jason Tatum has two first place votes. I, is this just a best player on the best team kind of thing? I don't know. But that to me feels a little bit off, despite the fact that Tatum's awesome. But the main story for the for the Celtics is obviously their depth and adding Drew Holiday and, and Chris Stapps Porzingis to a group that was already very good. But either way, Jokic, 85 out of 100 first place votes. He has a 300 point lead in the actual point totals for MVP here. 
And I saw on different mediums that are not Superbook Sports that Jokic has odds that are as high as minus 2,000 now, minus 3,000. The odds were shortening up to like minus 600, minus 700, minus 800 before last night and then before the straw poll came out. I do think that this sort of shifted the odds for sure. It wouldn't surprise me at all if that were the case. But either way, good to see Jokic sort of get that done and good to see that, hey, third MVP feels like it's on the way. Third MVP out of four seasons. It's very rare for any NBA player to do that. But as we've mentioned before on this podcast, there are like eight players in NBA history that have ever won three MVPs before. Uh, You go back to Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Moses Malone. I, I missed Moses Malone in there, but that's eight guys, it's eight players. All of them, I think, are in the top 15 in NBA history. Moses Malone, for, for some, might be a little bit lower, but I think if you talk to people historically, Moses Malone is a, clearly a top 15 player, or at least like 16. So it's like a prerequisite for half of the top 15 to just get three MVPs, three regular season MVPs. And if Jokic becomes the ninth player to do that, like, holy cow, that is a, it's a, it's a crazy bar. It's just a crazy bar to reach as a player, especially in today's NBA where parody has been such a big word that has been thrown around there, especially after the Warriors broke up. Because you look at, at the last five championship winners, you had the Lakers, you had uh, not the Lakers, you had the Raptors, you had the Lakers, you had the Bucks, you had the Warriors, and then you had the Nuggets. Each of those five have won the last five champions uh, championships. Denver has an opportunity here to be the only team in the last five years to win it back to back. And Jokic, I think, winning three of the last four MVPs, it's sort of shifting things over to maybe there's not as much parity as we thought there was. Obviously, during the regular season, there is for the most part, because like Denver probably, I still think this, they're probably not going to get the one seed. If they do, then good on them for being able to get that done. But I do think that, like, in general... (laughs) Jokic is actually making a strong case here, and the Nuggets are making a strong case here. The parity isn't actually a thing. That the Nuggets, when they really lock in, when Jokic really locks in, they are the best and the defining team of this era. There's a chance that, like, you think back to different eras of basketball, like the 70s were, gosh, who defined the 70s? It's just like, I don't know if there's any particular team that defined the 70s specifically, but the 60s were the Celtics, the 80s were the Celtics and the Lakers, the 90s were the Bulls, the 2000s were the Spurs and the Lakers combined, the 2010s were the Warriors. Could the Nuggets be the team that sort of like controls the 2020s? Could Jokic be the player that controls the 2020s from a, a narrative standpoint? From a individual dominance standpoint, it feels like he's well on that way because over the last four seasons, he'll have won three MVPs, four All NBAs, and should have been four first team All NBAs. Frankly, should have been four MVPs if we're being honest. But he's got all that. And then he's got a finals MVP along with a ring, obviously. And if he wins another, if Denver wins another, then you really start to see to see the trend here. You really start to see, okay, maybe the Nuggets are the team that has been defining this. And I look forward to that conversation. I, I certainly look forward to it because uh <laughs> got a couple of answers here on who defined the 70s. The Flint Tropics, uh, Will Farrell, he's uh he's doing what he can. <laughs> Jackie Moon, baby. And then the Knicks and the Celtics in the 70s. And frankly, the Knicks, I think, is is a good answer there. Willis Reed, obviously, um, and the Celtics, like they just define everything throughout history, basically. 
along with the Lakers. But that's a good point. And I think at this stage, if the Nuggets do end up becoming the team that defines the 2020s, that's going to be insane. <laughs> it's going to be insane to think about because nobody ever thought that that was possible. Nobody ever thought that Jokic could do this. I was asking Malone about the similarities between Jokic and Wemby last night. And he talked about, hey, everybody thought for the past four or five years that Wemby was going to be the future face of the league. And lo and behold, that's that's what's happening. With Jokic, nobody ever thought that. It was a complete surprise to everybody, including people within the Nuggets organization, that this has happened, that this has manifested. So like nobody could have predicted that the Nuggets were going to be the de dynasty-defining organization or future of the of the basketball leagues but it might actually be happening and that's a lot of fun that's a lot of it's a lot of attention it's a lot of things that i don't think anybody really expected but with this straw poll and sort of with the way that this is going if Jokic can kind of close the door and ultimately get this done i think it's done i think there's it's going to be really hard for anybody to sort of make up an 85 first place vote gap because the gap between him and Shea Gilgis Alexander, who has 10 first place votes, that's just too much. But if this is actually what happens, the Nuggets are going to be going down in history as a different level of organization than we thought that they ever could be. It's a really exciting thought. I, I love to credit everybody involved. Tim Connolly deserves a ton of credit. Michael Malone deserves a ton of credit. Jokic, I think, obviously deserves the most credit. And Jamal Murray. I saw a stat yesterday from um, Bennett Durando, who is over at Denver Post. You should make sure to follow his work. That without Jamal Murray, the Nuggets have perpetually been a 47-win team. 46, 47, 48 wins. When he comes back, Denver will have sort of evolve and they will become better than that for sure. And I think the Nuggets clearly need him. But going to be fascinating to see what Denver does in the playoffs. I really hope that Murray gets back here relatively soon because as awesome as the, the MVP stuff is, as awesome as all this narrative stuff is that I can talk about, Denver's got to get the job done. And the only way they're going to get the job done is with Jamal Murray. So it will be interesting to see where that happens. All right, let's take a final break. When we come back, we are going to circle back to the playoff picture. And I've got some uh, some things there that everybody should uh, should take a look at. But first, this message from Scott DeHuff. Hey, what's up? It's DeHuff. I love to have fun. So tune into my podcast, DeHuff Uncensored. I give on-filter takes on Denver sports, crazy news from around the world. Plus, you never know which one of my characters is going to swing by. Well, I hope one of them's your mother. Oh, Connery, Mama is always here for you. What in the blue heck is going on here? So subscribe and get ready to laugh to DeHuff Uncensored anywhere you find podcasts. Follow me on social media at DeHuff Podcast. All right, final segment here. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Let's wrap up with a playoff picture update. I believe that this is updated. Let me just see if this actually comes up. Um, there we go. Denver, and sorry about the, you can see my my finger here. Uh, Denver is 53 and 23. They are tied in the loss column with Minnesota and OKC. And what that loss column really signifies is everything. I would not say that Denver's in the driver's seat yet for the first seed in the Western Conference. I would not say that. They are tied in the loss column at 23 losses with Minnesota, with OKC. The Clippers have 28 losses. The Mavericks and the Pelicans have 30 losses. Sacramento and Phoenix are tied at 31. And the Lakers are at 33. And the Warriors are still at 34. They've, they've gone on a little bit of a run here. They've done a pretty nice job of sort of riding the ship. Houston, I think, is effectively... Like they're not eliminated, but they're, they're pretty close. Um, but... Taking your attention, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, to the magic numbers, uh, Denver, Minnesota, and OKC have all three clinched a top four seed. Dallas has 30 losses. They cannot make up the gap anymore. Uh, actually, has it, has it actually been clinched? Crap. 
Denver has definitely clinched. Minnesota and OKC, I'd actually have to crap. I, I think I'm, I messed that up, but Denver's effectively clinched a top four seed. They have effectively, like they will clinch a top three seed. The Clippers are at 28 losses. The Nuggets are at 23. They play like each other tomorrow. And if Denver does end up winning that game, they'll go to 54 wins. The Clippers will be at 29 losses, which means that they cannot catch Denver in the standing. So Denver's effectively clinched a top three seed. That is going to happen. Uh, and that's the most important thing is that, look, at this stage, all you want to do is avoid the play in. You want to get home court advantage in the first round. And then one good thing about clinching the three seed versus the four seed is that hypothetically, if the one seed and the four seed play in the second round and then the four seed wins, then as the three seed, if you win your matchup, you then get home court advantage again in that conference final. So let's say the Clippers, uh, if I, I'll just pull this back up here. Let's say everything goes chalk in the first round and Denver, or let's say Denver drops down to the three seed and Minnesota moves up to the one. Okay, sees at the two. If Minnesota and the Clippers play each other, if the Clippers happen to win that series, I don't think that they would, and Denver beats OKC, then the Nuggets would have home court advantage against the Clippers in the Western Conference Finals, which I do think is important. I do think that that's a thing. There would be some deja vu moments, I think, between the Western Conference Finals this year and last year if that were to happen. So I think the Nuggets are in a good spot. I think that they have a chance to get the one seed. Do I think it is a good chance? I think it's a good enough chance that they should continue to try to go for it because all they need to have happen, like they need one more loss from OKC and from Minnesota than what Denver incurs over the course of the next six, seven games. And what I mean by that is if I go to Tankathon here, if I go to the like the remaining strength of schedule, OKC in their seven games, they play Boston, Milwaukee, Dallas, the Kings, Indiana, and they also face the Spurs and the and the Hornets. So five tough matchups, two easy ones. We'll see whether Boston actually cares. Like they've clinched the one seed. I think that soon or like soon they will clinch the one seed in the entire thing. So I think those two teams play each other tonight. So would not surprise me if they go for it, if, if Boston kind of goes for it tonight. And then obviously Shea has been struggling with injuries. Chet's been struggling with some injuries here. Uh, I'm very curious. To, and Jalen Williams is also like struggling with something. So if the Thunder falter, if they lose maybe a game or two over the course of these next couple days, then maybe Denver does have an opportunity to go for it. Now, the Nuggets still have a magic number that is higher than what their record actually is, I believe. So they're going to need some help. They're going to need some help for sure. And they can get it done. And if they do get it done, then that'll be that'll be a big thing. It'll feel a lot like last year where they doesn't matter what the matchup is. It could be tough. It could be easy. But Denver's going to have hope court every single time unless they go to the NBA Finals and face Boston. Right now, Denver's got the second best record in the NBA. And if they put themselves into that position, they're going to feel pretty comfortable. Pretty comfortable in pretty much every single series that they play. Now, they could get uncomfortable real quick depending on the matchup. And I think the T-Wolves would be the team that probably makes them the most uncomfortable. But you cross that bridge when you come to it. You might not even face the T-Wolves. Like you might face OKC. You might face the Clippers. You might face these other teams rather than uh, Minnesota. So we'll have to just see what happens with Denver at that point. But I'm curious. I'm curious to see just how hard they're going to push the Nuggets. Like, actually, OKC's got the eighth toughest schedule based off of strength of schedule left. Minnesota's got the 19th toughest schedule. They actually face Denver on April 10th, a week from now. So that's on the second night of a back-to-back -back for Denver. That'll be a tough one. But that could really help Denver if, if there's an opportunity to go get the one seed. That suddenly becomes a pretty big game because 
if Denver has the opportunity, they should probably go for it. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing whether they actually do and whether they put themselves into that position to succeed because you can't look ahead to that game. That's that's what people think. Uh, that's, that's what people sort of miss in, in this stage. If you look ahead to the T-Wolves game, you miss the fact that Denver, they face the Clippers on the road. And then they face the Atlanta Hawks. The Hawks have been pretty solid. <laughs> Surprisingly, the Hawks have been pretty solid over the course of these last, I don't know, 10 games or so. They're 6-4. and four. They've won. Like They haven't fully clinched uh, everything, but they are pretty close. And at this point, they I think they just need one more win in order to do it or one more Brooklyn loss, but they're fighting for home court advantage in a playoff game or in a play in game. And if they get that done, like the Hawks are going to be not necessarily a tough out, but like they want to stick around. They want to see if they could pull a Miami heat from last year's playoffs. I don't think that they have the personnel to do it, but just cross that bridge when you come to it. So that's going to be a, like, and I know that, yeah, ice tray is out as snow wolf says, DeJounte Murray's been taking on a heavy burden and he's been shooting pretty well. And we've seen the Hawks beat Denver without Trey Young. Like we've seen that pretty consistently over the course of the last three years. DeJounte Murray, if he gets free and if Denver's playing a lazy drop coverage, then he's going to get these 18 footers and knock them down at a pretty consistent rate. So that's one that you just can't look ahead. If you do, you will die like Denver. That's that's me saying it loud and clear. Then Denver plays at Utah, the only place, the only sub-500 team that they've lost to this year. The only location that they've lost in this year was at Utah back in January. Denver didn't care in that game. They probably won't care in this one. So you can't look ahead. You can't look ahead to the Timberwolves, which is the next night at that point. Denver plays Tuesday, April 9th at Utah, and then they come back and they play the Minnesota Timberwolves on a back-to-back at home. You cannot look ahead to the Timberwolves. You have to take it one game at a time. If you don't, you will die. And Denver will not have the one seat. That's just not what, like, they're not going to be able to do it. And then likely to close it out at San Antonio, at Memphis, obviously. If Denver gets that done, then they might get the one seat. But I think at this stage, Nuggets fans should probably have it as, as this. One seed is at about 25% because they've lost the tiebreaker to Minnesota. They've lost the tiebreaker to OKC, and you can't get that back. So now you can help yourself out if you win that game against Minnesota because it gives them a loss, which is just not something that you're going to get a lot of. But I do think that they could get it done. Two seed, you're probably looking at about a 35% chance, 30 to 35%. And then the three seed, you're probably looking at a 40 to 45% chance. People don't want to hear it. They want to hear that Denver's going to get the one. I just know from experience here, this is right around the time where Denver, they take their feet off the gas. Maybe Jamal comes back and helps them out. Maybe he doesn't. That's the thing is that maybe when Jamal actually comes back, he's not that great. And Denver loses a little bit of momentum and their bench lineup doesn't look that great. And then the starters for whatever reason, they just don't get off the ground and then Denver loses a game that they probably shouldn't. We've seen that happen before. We've seen it happen when Joker comes back before. I remember the Houston game last year where Joker came back from an injury and then like turned the ball over eight times and like they lost. So look, it happens and Nuggets fans shouldn't get too attached to the idea of the one seed. It would be great. It is not necessary. Denver can win the NBA Finals from a two seed or a three seed. They do not have to be the one seed. Would it help? Sure. Should they compromise themselves to do it? Absolutely not. Do they need it? Absolutely not. They can get it done otherwise. They're still the most dangerous team of the Western Conference and probably the NBA. Should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to seeing how this conversation continues to evolve. If Denver does end up getting the one seed, that will be something to celebrate. It'll be a nice little thing for Denver to get the one seed in back-to-back years. They never had it up until last year, and then they won the championship. So 
it would feel good. I understand that, but I don't think that Denver should sell out for it. Try, but don't try too hard. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for this episode of Pick, Axe, and Roll, brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Really appreciate all the love and support on the podcast, as always. Denver's back tomorrow night. They will face the LA Clippers. I believe that is on national TV. I think I'll be back on the podcast on Friday. And then we've got some content with Swipa and I. We've been like, just make sure to go check out the Mile High Sports YouTube channel with all the other stuff that we've put out there. We've got another couple of videos coming out too, including one this afternoon. Should be really good. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. Leave a like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll talk to you guys on Friday.